Welcome everyone to the first lecture for module three. Now up to this point we've talked about uh, the basics and statistics. We've also, we've also talked about comparing individual scores to populations, as well as individual scores to each other. So the focus there in module two was on individual scores. Now we're going to go a step further and start talking about comparing samples, overall samples, to a much larger population. So why is it so important that we sample in statistics? Well, it all comes down to variability. If we only focus on individuals, we would increase the amount of variability within our statistical analyses. So if you think about it, each one of us are quite unique and quite different from someone else. And so we all have different past histories, we have different family experiences, we have different cultures that we may come from, we have different personalities, and all these things affect our behavior and our actions and our thoughts uh, here in the present. And so that increases variability. And as we've talked about in the past, in the previous lectures, that as we increase variability, we decrease reliability, which in turn decreases validity. In other words, our, our ability to get out what is truth, and that's truth with a lowercase t. And so one way to get around that is to sample. And if we can sample, and instead of looking at individuals, look at groups of people, then we're better able to minimize that variability. So if we minimize the variability, we increase reliability, and it increases our chance of having higher validity. In other words, getting at the truth of the phenomenon that we're studying. So there are two types of sampling that we'll talk about in, the, in this class. There's what we call convenience sampling, and then there's what we call random sampling. So convenience sampling is just as it sounds. It's a convenient sample. So the researcher has easy access to a group of people. And so maybe it might be students uh, within a, a course that's being taught, or just students at a university, or just uh, those that they may contact in a local mall. Uh, in all these cases, those, that, pop, that sample is convenient to the researcher. And because it's convenient, it's also biased. And so in other words, it'll represent maybe a classroom uh, very, very well, or maybe it'll represent Auburn very, very well, but it may not represent the overall population that there may be something about these convenient samples that's different than the larger population itself. So one special type of convenient sampling is called volunteer samples. And this is what we typically use in research in the behavioral sciences. Uh, so at the end of the day, everyone who participates in research has to consent. And so in one way or another, they're, they're a volunteer. And so we ask for their particular help for a research study, they volunteer their time, and um, we're able to get some analyses from them. But the problem with volunteer samples is that they're different than the overall population, or can be different. So volunteers tend to be high, higher in motivation, they're more likely wanting to, to help out, more altruistic, than maybe the general population would be. So we have to keep those things into consideration, that when we get a convenient sample, that they're likely to be a little bit different than the overall population. And maybe that matters, and maybe it doesn't, that depends on what we're trying to, to study. Now the other sampling technique is what is called random sampling. So random sampling, every single person in the population of interest has an equal chance of being selected. And so in that case, we're not asking for volunteers. Uh, in this case, we're selecting people in the population and they're participating. And it's done randomly so that everyone has an equal chance. And so if everyone has an equal chance, that means every characteristic of every individual that's chosen uh, every characteristic has an equal chance of being chosen as well, in which case the sample should better represent the overall population. So with a random sample, every person in the population has an equal chance of being selected. So that means for us to get a random sample, we need to know everyone in the population. Not only do we know who they are by name, but we also need to be able to contact them. And not only do we need to be able to contact them, so either have an email or an address or a phone number or something like that, we also have to get their consent. So in other words, they have to still agree to participate in our study uh, in most cases. And so it's actually quite difficult to get a, a truly random sample, but if we meet those conditions and we have everyone in, uh, in the population, we can list them out, then we can select them randomly. And we can do so uh, in several different ways, so several different methods. Uh, there's a table in your textbook in the back that's called a random uh, number table and in that, that table you can use that to select participants from a, a population. Uh, but no one really uses tables anymore and so usually 
uh, researchers will use a statistical program, uh, either Excel or SPSS or, or SAS, uh, to generate random samples. Uh, if that's not available, there are several random name and number generators that are available online that you can just do a Google search for, and so you can get random samples that way. So there are several different ways to get a random sample. Uh, the whole point is that whether you use a table or, or a statistical package or if it's online, the whole purpose is to remove the selection process from the researcher. And so uh, either the table will select, or the program will select, or the online uh, generator will, will select the, the, the participants in a study, but the researcher themselves will not directly select the participants. Uh, and that's because we want it to be unbiased. And so everything that, as a researcher, uh, I do, as a human being, is biased in some particular way. That's just how our brains work. Our brains are, are purposeful, and, and as such, whether consciously or unconsciously, it's biased. And because it's biased, it affects how we, how we behave. And so when we get a random sample, we have to remove that bias, and therefore remove the decision-making process from the researcher themselves. Now, of course, once we have a random sample, we need to ask the question, how big of a sample do we really want? And the answer is, as big as we possibly can, given the resources we have available. So we want as large of a sample as possible, given the practical, con practical constraints of our research project. Now, this is based on what we call the law of large numbers. Now, the law of large numbers tells us that the larger our sample size is, the better it will represent the overall population. So as a researcher, I want to collect as many participants as I possibly can, because the more participants I collect, the better my sample will represent the overall population. Now, of course, as a researcher, I need to remember that I only have so much money and so much time and so many research assistants, so I still have to keep it within a, a practical constraint. And so even though the law of large numbers tells us the larger the sample size is, the better it represents the population, I have to remember as a researcher, I can't measure everybody, and then comes a point where it's no longer efficient to measure more than a certain number of, of, of participants. So when we sample, we want as large a sample as we can, given the practical constraints, given our resources that we have available. So just as an example, let's say we have an overall population that we want to sample from, and there's 20,000 in this sample, or 20,000 individuals. And now, of these individuals, we'll say that 50% are female and 50% are male, so in other words, there's 10,000 of each. There's 5,000 freshmen, 5,000 sophomores, 5,000 juniors, 5,000 seniors. And uh, again, they're 50% they're Republican, 50% Democrat, so 10,000 uh, of each uh, political party. And so, if that's what our population consists of, so that's our 20,000 individuals, we, we may want to randomly sample from that population. So maybe we start with five. We randomly sample five people from that population. So remember, everyone in the population has an equal chance of being selected. So in other words, each person has a 1 in 20,000 chance of being selected. And we select five of them. So I used our made-up population, and I sampled using Excel, and I sampled five people, five participants from this population, and so we can look at those five people and we can look at their particular demographics. So it looks like in this case, with the five that we selected from this population of 20,000, it looks like we over-represent females. So we have 80% uh, of, uh, of the sample as females. So in other words, four of the five are, are females. We look also and we see we over-represented freshmen, and it looks like we may have over-represented Democrats as well, 60% um, to 40% to of, of Republicans. And so if I have a small sample, I may not reflect that population proportionally as well as if I had a larger sample. So now let's go ahead and let's select 20 from this population, and let's see if our proportions improve between our sample of 20 and the overall population of 20,000. So instead of sampling just 5, we now sample 20. We look at their demographics, and we see that it looks like we better represent the population. So if we randomly select 20 as opposed to 5, it looks like our proportion of males and females gets closer to the population percentages. So now it's 60-40 instead of 80-20 like we had with a sample of 5. We also look at Republicans and Democrats, and it looks like that has improved as well. 
it looks like it's getting closer to 50-50. It's now 45-55, which is better than 40-60 when we had a sample of 5. Now when it comes to class standing, it still looks like there is quite a bit of variability there. I'm not sure we've improved it too much, um, but we can definitely see we've improved two of the three demographic categories. So now let's go ahead and select 40 randomly from our population of 20,000, and let's look at the percents and the demographics. We'll notice that now our male-female ratio is better than it was in the two other sampling procedures at 5 and 20. Uh, it's now at 43% and 57%, uh, which is an improvement. The class standing is also a vast improvement. They're all around 25%, so it's really, really close to matching the population. Uh, the only thing that's really kind of differed or changed is the political party demographic. Uh, in this case, it looks like it's gotten worse. It's now gone from 45-55 to 3862. And it's important to remember that because we're randomly selecting from the population, we're leaving it up to chance. So there's always a chance that our sample won't represent our, our population very well. And so in this case, when it comes to political parties, it's actually gotten worse. But the other two demographic characteristics have, have gotten much better. They vastly improved. And so sometimes, when we leave it up to chance, uh, sometimes it gets a little bit worse, but generally, if we look at it as a whole, the, the representativeness from the sample of the population has actually increased. It has gotten better. So what happens when we select 150 from this population? So instead of 40, let's randomly select 150. We notice that our percentages pretty much across the board have gotten better. Uh, this is a pretty good representation of the overall population. Now there's still some variability, but it's never going to be perfect. Uh, but it definitely is going to give us something better than, let's say, convenience sampling. So as we increase the sample size, it gets better and better. Now, let's say we select 1,200 from our 20,000 or 2,500 from our, our 20,000, and we can look at those percentages, and we see again, uh, as we increase the sample size, that it's getting better. It's getting closer and closer to representing the overall population. In fact, at 2,500, we see that uh, it's actually very, very close. It looks like it's within a percent under within all of the demographic categories, and so that, that's really, really good. Now, the problem with that is that, well, as researchers, rarely do we have the resources to measure 2,500 individuals or 2,500 people. You have to think that you have to contact all these individuals, you have to collect data from them, you then have to code them and ana analyze them, and you have to have the manpower and the resources to do it. And so having 2,500 in, uh, individuals in your sample may not actually be very, very efficient given the resources that you have. And so just looking at, at our different numbers here, it may be reasonable, given our resources or constraints financially, that maybe using a sample of 150 is good enough. And so that's something you'll learn in statistics is that uh, at some point we have to say it's good enough. And, uh, and so statistics will never be perfect. It'll never give us a perfect representation when we sample, and when we get our results from statistical tests, it's never going to be uh, perfect. It's based on probability, and so there's always that, that chance for, for an error. Uh, and also, we have to think within the, the real world and the practical constraints that we have, that sometimes getting that, the largest sample uh, possible may not be very cost-effective uh, given the increase. So those are all things to keep in mind, but generally, uh, as this, this chart shows, as we increase sample size, we better represent the population from which we're selecting. And so that's the law of large numbers. So random sampling in relation to the law of large numbers is ideal, but the problem is it's rarely possible. So for, uh, for us to do random sampling, we need to know three things. We need to know, first, every single person or thing in the population uh, before we can even randomly select. So uh, every person or thing has to have an equal chance of being selected. So we have to know them first in order for us to give them that equal chance of being selected. Uh, the second thing is that we have to be able to contact them or observe them in some way. And so not only do we have to know every single person, we also have to be able to contact them either through uh, an email or through a phone number or through an address or, or something where we can get in contact with them. The third thing is that they have to consent. So especially dealing with, with people, is that they still have to agree to participate. You can't make someone participate in one of our studies. They still have to, at some level, volunteer. So rarely, rarely is it possible to have all three of those conditions to do a truly random sample. Now it does occur 
it's just very rare. So again, we need to know who's in the population. We have to be able to contact them, and they have to give their consent. So that means if we don't have those three conditions for a random sample, then by default, we have what's called a convenient sample. Now in this class, we'll dichotomize it as either random or convenience. Realize that there's other types of sampling methods that fall between those two, but we won't learn them in, in this class here today. So if it's not a random sample, we're going to say that it is a convenience sample. In other words, there's some bias in our sample, and that bias limits the generalizability of our findings. So in other words, our samples don't necessarily directly represent the overall population. So we call this external validity, and we'll talk about external validity later in, in the class. But generalizability and representativeness of the sample to the population is what we call external validity. Okay, so that means replication is especially important for uh, convenient samples. So that means we need to get several different types of convenient samples uh, in order to compare and make sure that what we find in our research studies uh, is an actual effect or a true effect. So if we just have one convenient sample, that doesn't tell us a whole lot. But if we have several different convenient samples that vary on different demographics, then we can be more confident in our, in our results. Now it's important to note also that replication is important for random samples, because if you remember, uh, random samples are based on probability, and so there's always a chance that our sample may not represent the population. It's just not as critical as it is for convenient samples. So random samples still have a chance for error, but not as much as a convenient sample does. And so when given the two, a choice between the two, we prefer to randomly sample whenever possible, and that will help us represent the overall population. That means our results from our studies should generalize back or represent the population as a whole. So in summary, there's several different ways that we can get a random sample. Typically, we'll use a stat package, such as Excel, but there's some other methods that we've talked about also. Uh, when we get a sample, we want that sample to be as large as possible. The larger it is, the better it represents the population. We have to remember as researchers that random sampling is rarely possible, so most of what we do is uh, convenient sampling. So we have to recognize that with convenient samples that there are likely some differences between the sample and the overall population. And then also when it comes to random samples, we have to remember that uh, even if we have a random sample, it doesn't always give us accurate results. So we leave it up to chance, and from time to time, our sample may not represent that population. Uh, and so usually if we can replicate one or two times then uh, with random samples, then we can be more confident in the results that we have.